you so much, Guillermo, and thank you uh, for this department for inviting me, for having me here. I accept it with pleasure because, believe it or not, it is my very first visit to Madrid in a quite long life by now. So I took this opportunity with pleasure. I understand the time is maybe a little bit difficult for you. I may be standing between your hunger and the lunch, right? So that's always a challenge. But I think we will master that. I brought you basically five topics or five subtopics. And we will walk through them one by one. The first is uh, what I call the changing global landscapes which I think is still quite often overlooked because we have trouble to finally accept the notion that the nation state is undergoing fundamental changes because it is such a cozy thing and we'd like to stick to it. But there are problems with that. The second point I want to stay with for a while is the EU after 60 years which is basically talking about that the EU is a success story. Yes, surprise, surprise. We almost hear and read about crisis and challenges, but I would still argue it is mostly a success story, actually. And after this, I will move on to current challenges. There are plenty. Uh, we have heard this morning about one, Brexit, so you know already a lot about that. Uh, and I subscribe to what has been said, but it is one out of maybe 10 real serious crises we are facing right now. Then I will stay for a couple of minutes with the issue of populism. You talked about it yesterday, I heard. I could not be here. <coughs> so that means there may be some repetition, so don't be too angry when I say something which has been mentioned already yesterday. And finally, when we have the time for that, I will offer two slides with potential outlooks, like where to move from here. So let me start with the Shanxi global landscapes. There are three or four issues I would like to mention at this slide, which are related, but at the same time quite separate. The first one is that we are experiencing significant changes in the traditional state system. Number one being that the bipolarity, polarities is a core issue in international relations theories. Do we have unipolar systems, bipolar systems, multipolar systems, nonpolar systems, right? That bipolarity, which was characterizing the second half of the 20th century, the Cold War, the East-West conflict, is gone for good. And that has significant effects on the stability and cooperation between governments. So there is much more instability today than before. A second issue is that not only inside the state system there are changes going on. I also should mention the increasing rivalry between the United States of America and China, which many people who have historical knowledge about Rising and descending powers are afraid may lead to war because in two-thirds of all cases it did, historically. So that's also a big one. But structurally more important is this one, that we all are facing increasingly what we may call global flows. For example, flows of capital, flows of people, you may call it migration, flows of content, flows of resources. And these flows, by their very nature, are border crossing. Most flows don't stop at borders and show their passport. They keep floating. That has major effects on the regulatory capabilities of governments. Governments often feel much more powerless than before in terms of controlling, registering, modifying, navigating these kind of flows. So that's a very important change we should be aware of. <coughs> And the third issue, which may happen not so much in visibility to the young people here in the room, that what we call the liberal world order that has been established after 1945, which lots of organizations and institutions like the United Nations 
to some extent also the EU, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund and organizations like those, is threatened. It may be derailed. Some people say it is already in the process of being derailed. And as of now, there are no clear visible alternatives to that. So if you take these three things together, you can argue that the changes we are experiencing, we are facing right now, are very serious, maybe much more serious than ever after 1945 before. We understand that that is not very good news, these changes for many people, because we have a tendency to stick to old notions and old concepts and old orders, right? And sometimes then we overlook tipping points where really massive changes are materializing. <coughs> and also, subscribing to many things, what has been said before the coffee break, we have increasingly a situation of blurred narratives, stories, which people can believe in to understand what is happening in the world, what is going on. The old stories, the oldest story, which was also quite powerful, was the narrative of modernity, which was quite integrating for all the time after the 14th and 15th century, after Renaissance, at least in Europe. Modernity in the 19th and 20th century had two derivatives. One was democracy and market, the other was socialism. Both are undergoing problems right now, to put it mildly, right? So they are losing credibility. And there is no big alternative plausible narrative, as we are seeing when we look around and trying to understand the debates in the discipline and far beyond. <coughs> Globalization, which is the all-encompassing trend, don't have the time now to define it, but if you want, we can go into that in the debate, is very ambivalent and very emotional for many people. Globalization produces two things, opportunities, but also risks, and both is important. And we should not look only on one side of it. A very important trend is that hundreds of millions of people in the last 12 to 15 years have been lifted out of poverty. That is very important for those people. It happened in China, but not only in China in many other countries as well. I like to use the opportunity to, to indicate that poverty is not the same as inequality. It is often mixed and confused, right? So poverty is when you do not have enough to eat and not, no place for sleeping and stuff. Inequality is when you perceive that there is some kind of unjust twist built in into some social system. But at the same time, also, hundreds of millions of people feel uprooted by the power of markets and also by the speed of change. That is what we call acceleration, right? So in these two points, I think you can cover easily, or maybe not easily, but still, <laughs> the ambivalence and ambiguity of globalization. <coughs> these contrasting, maybe even opposed experiences fuel uncertainties. If you look at many surveys by Pew Research and by many other companies across societies, you figure out when you ask people what are your wor worries, your major worries, many people tend to say uncertainty. And these uncertainties have political effects because uncertainty fuels populism. That is what you talked about yesterday. The point before is also relevant that when we properly, we come to that in a couple of minutes, when we properly want to understand the core reason for populism and similar trends, radicalization, fundamentalism, we have to understand that that is not only an economic issue, it also is very much a cultural issue. And we are talking here about a coexistence of those two risks and challenges which people are facing. So, so much for the changing global landscapes. If you want to take one thing home from this, it is the fact that nation states and national governments are obviously not disappearing, they are still around. But they are undergoing changes of their capabilities and their efficiency. 
are, there are many problems related to that because nation states are still the most legitimized political units we have. And when this relatively legit legitimized political unit is undergoing a loss of efficiency, loss of performance, when the states are underperforming and there are no alternative political units who can take over or are less legitimized, that is a problem. Good. You after 60 years, <coughs> why do I think it is still a success story? What you do not know, fortunately, most or maybe all of you in the room here, that one of the biggest reasons for creating it was not an economic one, but a political one. In the 20th century, we had two world wars emerging from Europe. And the core idea of the European Union and its creation was to prevent any new thing like that one, especially to integrate France and Germany, politically, economically, and as far as possible. <coughs> so this idea materialized ever since the EU has, has been established on the territory of the EU admittedly in some other places in Europe it was different, there was no new war, a big success. Now when your generation was born into a world with no war, you may think like what is he talking about, why war? But again in the last century we had big wars in Europe, so it is a big story, a big thing, and it was possible to prevent another case. Also, Another thing sometimes overlooked is that the EU also managed to prevent or to moderate conflicts not inside the EU but next to the EU by export of stability. That is a very interesting thing also from a political science perspective that even countries and societies which were not yet members of the EU reacted to the very prospect of becoming a member in the future by making, making certain reforms and certain changes. So the prospect of potentially becoming a member already had some effect. Also when it comes to protection of minority rights, human rights and things like that. So there was some stabilization through extension or even the prospect of extension. I think that's also worth mentioning. <coughs> Another thing is that in our public discourse and public debates, we focus mostly on, obviously, media mostly focus on problems and crisis. That is understanding from the media position. But then we overlook that about 80 to 90 percent of the integrated policy fields work without problems. So most of the integrated areas still are working okay. It's not only about the euro crisis, it's not only about immigration, there are many other things, trade, customs, police cooperation, legal cooperation, whatever, which still are working. So that is overlooked, but it should not. <coughs> and the reason for that is that we actually do have a fabric, a texture of rules, of norms, of habits, of customs inside the EU, which are working and already for many decades. That is interesting to note also from a political science perspective because, as many of you know, there are theoreticians and in international relations who flatly deny that that can happen. They keep saying that nation states do not cooperate, at least not over time, because they have core interests, which is survival, which is uh, competition with other countries, and they never would cooperate with other countries because they never can trust them, right? But we do see that it may work, that it does work under certain conditions, and that the government's inbuilt interest is to reduce transaction costs, that is how we call it, and that is the basic trigger for making them cooperating. So in many cases it works. <coughs> Free movement internally is also an important thing. <coughs> What we may not appreciate enough, because when we move from one country to another one, we don't have to show passports or identity cards, right? We have free movement of services, of capital, of goods and of people. <coughs> and yes, they belong together. That's another thing which is debated in the Brexit debate right, right now. 
And that is also an important thing. Uh, and again, when young people move freely since they were born into this Europe, they would probably do not appreciate that and they discount it. Of course there is free movement, right? But it is not of course. It was very different until a couple of decades ago. <coughs> we do have a waiting line. When the EU would, set, would be such a disaster as it is often portrayed, probably new societies, other countries would not stand there and want to join. But we still have a significant number of countries which want to become members. In the foreseeable future, if you ask me, prospects for that are slim, beyond maybe very few cases from the Western Balkans. But we have a significant number of countries who are interested in joining. <coughs> and then we have the ENP. ENP is the European Neighborhood Policy, which is a set of bilateral agreements, not multilateral, bilateral agreements between the European Commission and these countries. When you look at the map, how that looks like, you see here the complete picture of the EU proper, which are the dark blue countries, the light blue countries are the candidate countries, and the brown ones are ENP countries. And don't overlook, please, that we have ENP countries in the east and in the south. In Eastern Europe, six, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, and many more in the MENA area, Middle East and Northern Africa, right? So again, these are not members, but these are associated by bilateral agreements. And when you look at this image, you easily may figure out that the EU looks like quite an important geopolitical actor. Well, it is not, right? But when the EU would not exist now, given the crisis and problems we do have, I'll come to that in half a minute, I think it, has, it would have to be invented, actually, to cope with this crisis. And this patchwork of association agreements, while it is not very um, uh, successful and, and active so far in, in geopolitics, I think it is still an important factor we should reckon with. <coughs> now let me come to my third point, which is current political challenges. I have five political challenges for you and five economic ones. I start with the political ones. There is no hierarchy or priority, so it's not a certain order of things. Transnational terrorism. Maybe like 10 years ago, when you talk to people in Brussels or to, in all other places in, in the EU and talk about terrorism, that say they would say far away from us, but not in Europe. That has changed. Terrorism can now hit any place, any time. That was the case in Spain in Germany, in the UK, in France, and many other countries. Now the interesting thing here from a political science perspective, I would say, is that we have significant differences to other forms of terrorism we were encountering in the 1970s, let's say. When you compare today's terrorism, which was which what was happening then in the Basque area, Spain and France, in Northern Ireland, in Germany with the Red Army faction, and in Italy with the Brigato Rosse. What is surprising now is that we are now facing terrorist actions without a message. It is not like that they send a piece of paper with claims and expectations to a government and say, you have to do this and if not we will hit you. They just come and hit you. So why is that happening? And when you think about it, there are a couple of answers, but I think the most convincing one is it is mostly about attention grabbing. The more attention for one group of people, for one organization, the more chances for increasing recruitment to find more people who want to do these kind of actions and to get funding and sponsoring. The problem is there is not much you are a small group here, so I can be frank. There's not much we can do about it. 
because the only sound response would be not reporting. Then they wouldn't have attention. Can we do that in liberal, free societies? Of course not. There is reporting. There will be reporting. That refuels these kind of activities and actions. So that is a problem, and unfortunately, I guess I have to say, to some extent, that's the new normal. We won't get rid of it. Issue number two, <coughs> unregulated migration, immigration, which is not a refugee crisis. Every time I hear reports on the radio and on TV about refu refugee crisis, it makes me nervous because in closer inspection it is not. It is a very complex phenomenon of very different groups of people coming to Europe and to other places. There are asylum seekers. When they fulfill the conditions of the High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva, they may be accepted as refugees. Then there are family reunion people who are entitled, when some parts of the family are accepted, also to come to the country. Then there are tolerated people. Then there are uh, migrant workers, right? So the number of accepted refugees is somewhere between 30 and 40 percentages of all incoming people. So to call the whole thing a refugee crisis is misleading. When we look at the current incoming people <coughs> and compare it with migrant flows Europe was exposed to after 1945, we see four distinctive features, three or four. And before I come to that, let me add that from 1945 to 1995, not only Western Europe, but West Germany, not all of Germany, only Western Germany was taking in 24 million people without really much problems. There were 12 million refugees after the Second World War from the former German territories in the East. The 1960s, there were 8 million to 9 million guest workers, mostly from Southern Europe. In the early 1990s, there were 3 to 4 million people from the former Soviet Union. And mostly, they were kind of integrated without too much problems. Now, when we compare those people coming then and coming now, what you see is that out of the incoming people after 1915, I'm sorry, 2015, 2016, out of them, 80 to 90 percent were Muslims. Why is that a problem? Potentially, because living in a Muslim society is different from living in a secular society. Concerning the role of women in the society, concerning the priority of secular versus religious norms, and also looking at a couple of other indicators. Out of these people, again, 80 to 90 percent were male. That is also different from previous incoming flows. Another thing which is different from previous experiences, European experiences with migration, is that we are facing in the MENA area at this point of time about six failing or failed states. That is a big one. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, Sudan. When you talk to our decision makers internally or openly, there is not much in terms of ideas how to fix that, or if to fix it at all. But when you have really failing states where the state authorities are not able to run the country, right, to offer educational opportunities, to offer jobs, then we should not be too surprised about these migration effects. Another difference is the fourth one, eight with unintentional consequences. Many people in the media and in politics say, okay, the one thing we should do and we can do is to increase development aid. But there is one little problem with development aid. When it works, it lifts people from poverty to lower middle class. Once people arrive in the lower middle class, they can afford to buy tickets and they can afford to buy to pay the smugglers. 
So we have already a couple of studies that actually development aid this way increases and refuels migration pressure instead of reducing it. Because the real poor people never can come. They cannot afford it. That's also an issue. So what kind of development aid would be a good idea to stabilize these countries and not to increase out migration? And also we have a huge demographic pressure in Africa. It is the biggest pressure in the world. Until 2050, there will be billions of more people in Africa without living and being born into countries which have the proper infrastructure. So that is something we seriously have to think about. We have more, problem number three, than before countries and governments, which I may call spoilers. What is a spoiler? That are members of organizations, norms, routines, strategies, agreements, which ignore the rules. Turkey is a clear case. Russia is at least as clear a case. When we talk about or look at the annexation of Crimea, the metal link in Eastern Ukraine, the metal link in Syria, and also not directly political issues, like poisoning spice or ex-spice, or like state-organized doping. So all taken together, there's a clear mentality in Russia to not accept rules when they think it is not in their interest. There are also spoilers inside the EU. Hungary, Poland, potentially Italy, which is clearly on a course of violating stability pact rules right now with the new budget. And we have to admit that we are not particularly well prepared for addressing that. We, ha we do have rules for who can become a member, but we do have weaker rules or more unclear rules what to do with spoilers who already are inside the EU, right? That is something what we have to experience right now. <coughs> A quite new phenomenon, it's not only a EU thing, but also an EU thing, is that we have increasingly security problems. That is most of all related to the fact that the European NATO members, many of them EU members, most of them never adequately funded their military because they thought automatically when stuff happens, when bad stuff happens, the US comes and helps, right? That is what we call free riding. So yes, there was free riding for decades in the West European countries. But the other component is that we now have an American administration which uh, comes up with some innovations like, oh, we may protect you, but only when you paid your bill. Now, this is not what we understand under NATO Article 5, automatic guarantee. When one NATO member is attacked, then all others also react as if they would have been attacked, right? So, it is not officially to revoke the guarantee, but it is to seat the, to implant a seat of doubt. That is already enough, and that is what happened. So that explained why we now have a lively debate in Europe, also in the EU, about strengthening European defense capabilities in case that the NATO guarantee is not working as it used to do. And then the Brexit thing, uh, where we have heard already many things this morning, so it can be particularly short here. At this point of time, maybe it is suffice to say that it is when you have negotiations like this one, it is of course also and maybe mostly a negotiation between the EU and the country which wants to leave. But implicitly, it always also is an implicit negotiation with countries which in the future may consider to leave. Because the question is, what signals are you sending? So when we are sending now the signals, or like Mr. Tusk likes to say, they may be cherry picking, right? You like the customs union, but you don't like the freedom of movement. So okay, you get the customs union, but not the freedom of movement. 
What do you think other potential countries who may consider in the future to leave will learn from that? So that is something to be considered also now when the EU talks with the UK. So at this point of time, many people don't know a lot about it, I don't know what your assessment is, is that the chances of avoiding a hard Brexit, a double hard Brexit, is about 50-50. It can go very badly, it can be science something, you don't know. So that's the political side. Now let's move on to the uh, economic challenges. Um, the first one is still, and not only again, but still, the Euro crisis. Because it is not so much in the headlines as it used to be, does not mean that the Euro crisis has been solved. It is not. The Euro was both an economic project to enable countries and companies not to exchange different currencies when they trade with each other, but it also was a political project. Because when it was introduced around 1990, that was the same time when the USSR collapsed and the GDR was almost collapsing. So the German unification was moved on the agenda of European politics. And German unification was not a pet project of many of Germany's neighbors. Especially the UK, France and Italy were very skeptical very skeptical about this prospect. Again, a united, potentially assertive Germany. Maggie Thatcher once said, we beat them twice and now they are back again here. So, in this context, the Euro also served a political purpose, sign signaling to others that we give up our strong German mark and the strong role of the Bundesbank and in integrating the German, at least, currency into a European project, which is the Euro. But everything had to be speedy and quickly, right? And that is why now, as a result, we have a union, we have an integrated currency. But we do not have integrated social and budget policy. Why is that a problem? Because you have different agencies. The currency, the integrated currency, is run by the European Central Bank, which is independent more or less, from governments. But social policy and budget policy, fiscal policy, are run by the national parliaments. And this is a structural mismatch of governance, which cannot be solved anytime soon. And even if we would have a political consensus of organizing that, of now adding the social and fiscal union, this issue means a change of treaties. In other words, in a couple of countries, we had to organize a referendum on this. You can imagine what would happen with these referenda in populist times, so that's not an option. This is going to stay. <coughs> we have an increasing debate, as you all know, between free trade proponents and those who say, well, it is better to protect our borders. That is what we call protectionism or mercantilism. And also we have politicians who come up with the interesting idea that a trade deficit indicates a weak country. Why the fact that in some countries people have a liking for Spanish oil or for German cars indicates that the country where they are living is weak, I don't quite understand, but that is a very popular public perception. This is very dangerous for the EU which is extremely dependent on trade, both imports and exports. So free trade is one of the core ideas of European integration. Another thing we have to consider, you have to consider, is that in Europe, most societies are aging. So we have a demographic change. We have a inverted pyramid from having very young people funding relatively small groups of pensioners or retired people to an inverted pyramid, having ever less young people who have to fund ever more older people. And you can easily figure out that that does not work with you when you keep all social entitlements intact without changing or modifying, let alone to add new social entitlements. So there is a lot of pressure on European societies coming to terms with that. 
the same time, we also have to register that in many countries in the world, we have the opposite trend. We also have societies who are getting younger and younger, especially in Southeast Asia and in Northern Africa. Half of the societies sometimes are younger than 25. They experience completely different challenges. Are there enough, enough educational opportunities? Are there enough jobs for them? And if not, those people also may consider moving out, right? So demographics is a big variable in our debate about where we are going politically in the future. That also is related to automatization and digitalization. Just one sentence on that. There are a couple of professional groups which in seven to ten years will be gone. Professional drivers, no bus drivers, no taxi drivers, no other drivers will be around. What are we going to do with these groups of people? That is an important consideration and we rather should look into that now than later or too late. <clears throat> okay, point number four. Against what I have said so far, it may be not so surprising, given the rising uncertainties and many other factors which are fueling these tendencies, that we talk more and more about populism, though it is not new at all. It started in the 19th century, both in the United States as a farmer's movement and then also in Russia as a Narotniki, also kind of farmer's movement. And then for many decades, no one actually was talking about it. And now it is kind of back on the agenda. And when we look what is relatively consensual talking about populism, well, in social sciences, really anything is consensual, right? We have to live with that. But a couple of things are more or less kind of, kind of consensual. I would say popu that populism is directly correlated with emerging uncertainties is pretty much established. So the more people are irritated or uprooted or whatever, don't comprehend what is going on, the more open they may be for populist uh, seduction. The fact that in Germany, when we have almost every night, every evening, political infotainment shows, talk shows, right? When the topic moves away from domestic issues to international issues, European issues, American issues, whatever, you lose half of the people. Half of the people, from 12, 13 percent, that it drops to six to seven percent. They take the remote control and move away. They don't want to be bothered by international or global things. Understandable. They have a job, they have a family, they have other things to care about, right? But how can you expect people to have a proper understanding about the euro, about migration issues, about proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, whatever, that when they don't care? So. That is the big one. <coughs> also, consensus is that one of the core elements of all populist argumentation, or however you call it, is offering simplified, not only simple, but simplifying answers on complex challenges. They basically reduce complex problems to a core, but not always the reduction is adequate or reasonable. <clears throat> but it is popular. Also, that is not completely consensus, but it is uh, a position which I guess I tend to. I would argue that populism is more a discursive style than an ideology. So it is more a way of talking or shouting than a concrete ideology. <coughs> this one always provokes big uh, waves in the classroom when I say that in Germany in my classes, but I say it anyways. There is an increasing convergence because between so-called right and left-wing populist groupings. If you don't believe me, you may go to YouTube and compare video clippings from the election campaign in 2016 between Mr. Trump and Mr. Sanders. Or you may look at voter movements in Germany from the leftist party to AfD. Or you may look in the European perspective at left, uh, at Syriza and Podemos and others and then compare it with some issues of uh, more so-called rightist movements. I'm not saying they are identical, but there is a convergence 
between these groupings. And the one point where they agree most of all is, I hope it is on this slide, no, it is not. And now I think falls apart here. Uh, but let me say it anyway. The one thing where they agree most of all is that a strategy of regaining sovereignty and refixing and re-strengthening national borders will do away with the problems. So they promise the people, when you vote for us, we will make sure that we regain our national sovereignty independence, we strengthen our borders, and the problems like migration and trade will disappear. That's not going to happen. But people like to think it and to believe it. <coughs> it's a broad phenomenon territorially, and unfortunately the demand for populist uh, messages is growing. And then what are the issues? Elites versus real people. That's easy to understand. The elites are betraying the real people, the pure people, right? They don't want what the people actually expect them to do. Never mind that most of the populist activists are elites themselves. But still, that is what they preach. <coughs> Number two, mainstream media are lying. Close to that is the highly interesting concept of alternative facts or alternative reality which is also activated frequently. Number three message, transnational trade kills jobs. Guess what? It is true. But what populists do not say is that transnational trade also creates jobs. So the real message is how can we retrain potentially workers who lose their jobs in traditional old <laughs> profiles for being employed that they may be able to be qualified also with new skills for new jobs. So populists only focus obviously on this one, but not on the creative side. Unregulated immigration is detrimental, of course. And when they are in Europe, the EU is evil. That is often not said directly, but it is said indirectly by fighting the euro. So the euro is evil, right? And in those cases where there are referenda prepared, the referenda should be directed against the euro. And after the euro for this country can be abolished, it will, be mo it will move on. This is obviously, obviously also the case because the EU takes over lots of the sovereignty, which used to be the nation, the nation states. So that is closely related to what I said before. Right, that the populists always talk about regaining sovereignty, regaining uh, independence, and strengthening the borders, and the EU is standing in the way here. Very important from an international relations perspective, also multilateralism has failed. States do not cooperate, and they should not cooperate. And when we are member in trade agreements, in armaments agreements, and whatever agreements, we are climate change, protection, agreements, we rather leave that. And the promise is, as I said before, national borders have to be strengthened, patriotism promoted, and sovereignty has to be regained. So on these two slides, I think you have a pretty um, concise wrapping up of what the populist messages are. In many cases, they sometimes raise issues with other parties and other political parties are not so keen and addressing. So the big problem is, is it realistic what they are promising? Is it doable at all what they are promising, right? And especially this nation state strengthening thing, I think, is definitely not happening, no matter if the populists are in power or not. <coughs> One thing, what I would like to add, which is not on these slides, is that a big problem of populism is also what was mentioned before the coffee break, the style of talking. When you sit in a talk show, as a liberal professor, let's assume, and you are facing one or two populists in the round, right? The first thing you will experience is they yell at you, they shout at you, they cut you off, right? And then you are in an interesting position. Either 
you shout back and you cut them off as well. Or you go like, sorry, moderator, can I add a little bit? I was not yet done. Can I get one more minute? Which looks a little bit weak, right? So when you have this kind of alternative, that is very difficult. Personally, as a citizen, I have lots of sympathy for Michelle Obama's famous saying, when they go low, we don't go low. But is that a doable, a realistic recipe for behaving in this kind of media context? That's the big question mark. And now the last thing, because I'm also reaching my time limit, I have a couple of things which I think we may consider when we talk how this, uh, the problems of the European Union and the achievements of the European Union, the experiences with the European Union, and also the role of populism may affect our policies in the future, next five to ten years. That is obvious, so it doesn't require any kind of explanations. The US will remain in relative terms the most powerful country in the world, but it will not be interventionist. The notion of many people that in America, many people are just waiting to go again into another country and to fight something is mistaken. And that is not related to the political class, but it is related to the extreme unpopularity of international adventures in the population of the United States of America. For most people, it is a whole chain of failures. The Vietnam War, the Afghanistan War, the Iraq War, and whatever came else, all failures, and we paid dearly, we had to suffer a lot, and we don't want to do this again. And no matter if you have a democratic executive or a Republican uh, administration, you have to take that into account. So I think that is a very important context condition. As Mr. Obama, famous political scientist, said rightly, Russia will remain a middle power. It is based on energy rents, distributing energy rents, and the whole economic model of Russia is still based on exporting carbon-based energy, oil and gas, which is a non-viable business plan. But this current group, which is running Russia, will not diversify for political reasons. So as long as these people keep uh, running the country, we should better not expect any changes. China, where I have a couple of programs myself for 15 years, is moving to a very hard authoritarian domestic form of governance. I'm saying that thinking about it and having exper I'm, I'm experiencing myself with my programs in China. Also the companies give the same kind of impression. We do not know so much how China will finally act internationally. There are different ideas competing so far with each other, but the domestic landscape is moving in a way which is uh, uh, threatening, I would say. The EU and Germany will grow in relative terms, but neither the EU nor Germany are anywhere close to playing a relevant global role and won't be in the near future. You have seen, you may remember my map, which looks quite impressive, right? But we do not have the conscience and the readiness, neither of the elites nor of the people, to reconsider and to define the EU as a global actor as of now. <coughs> I'm not saying if I appreciate that or if you find that wrong, I'm trying to tell you how I perceive it. And populism will remain. Last slide. A liberal trajectory of uh, development and also the liberal global order, I would argue, are still the best way of organizing relations between political units globally. I don't know any better model, personally. So I would say it is worth defending. And in any case, it is easier to defend it than once it would be gone to rebuild it. But we can debate that. The EU that was also debated this morning should think about two things next to other things which were mentioned to 
work a little bit on its perception, which is so far not particularly a caring perception. And it definitely is not considered as being cool, am I right? But in the early mid-50s of the last century, it was considered as very cool to do away with the Schlagbäume, right? The borders between countries and societies. Very cool thing. Many people were actually taking them out, not quite legally. So to redefine parts of EU's capabilities and outreach options, we talked about it before, that it changes the perception, I think, would be a brilliant job. Something which is not very popular, but we have to think about it, is if we knowingly want to stumble into a situation of becoming ever more defenseless, helpless, or if we are prepared to do whatever is required for establishing a broadly autonomous defense capability, which is costly. If we don't want to do that, we should be aware of the alternative. Migration, a very difficult thing, with no quick fix, there is no panacea solution for it, in no way, but there are a couple of things which could be done to increase transparency, compliance by all sides involved, especially to quicken up the processes, the procedure, that people don't have to wait for months or even years until they get a decision about their status, so to make it faster, right? And also open up pragmatic and realistic channels for labor migration. Many people who apply for asylum are actually labor migrants. When they will be offered reasonable ways of applying, like in Australia or Canada, chances are that they do not use the other way. So there is some homework to be done in some of the countries of the EU and the EU altogether. <coughs> we also need a more effective industrial policy that not a significant number of the most important technologies from now on in the next five to ten years will be only play a, will only play a role in our other countries like in the US or in China. Europe is not very effective so far in planning its own industrial policy. <coughs> and also I have lots of sympathies for looking more to ally with like-minded partners. Other countries also do that, right? Like Canada, like Australia, like Japan, like South Korea, like Taiwan, where still you find societies which have some understanding for and some practice with liberal institutions and acting in this way. So there is some similarity, at least, in terms of value orientation. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.